So tonight, what we're taking in here in regards to Mark's gospel is the great king emerges and Jesus is now being seen visibly by those closest to him. As Mark's gospel closes out in this section here, um, it is, you know, as I was talking to a pastor friend of mine this morning, earlier today, he says, what are you teaching on tonight? I says, I am teaching on the, uh, the ghost scriptures. And he starts laughing and he's all, what do, you, what do you mean? I says, I'm teaching Mark's gospel, chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. He goes, is that what you call them? I says, yeah. I go, they're either uh, non-existent or they're led by the Holy Ghost, one or the other. And uh, he says, you know, I never brought that up when I taught through there. I just taught through the text. The reason why I say that is because um, there have been many that have debated verses 9 through 20 if they are actual verses that Mark wrote. Uh, many believe that verses 9 through 20, and it's actually been proven, were later inserted in the second century. And one of the things that we could see here is that they are lacking in what is called the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, I have a copy of those two of John's Gospel in my office in a, in a frame. Um, and also the Vaticanus. And um, so in some of the earliest manuscripts, Mark's Gospel chapter 16 verses 9 through 20 is not there. But later on we see... Um, Right around the second century is where we begin to see even early church fathers debate for the fact that in some of the earliest manuscripts, these verses are not there. So the point being made is that ultimately these verses, verses 9 through 20, I would say some would ask the question, were they there? Were they not there? How do you handle that? And many even believe that because of the Greek text, that these are words that are not normal to um, Mark's writing in the rest of the book. Uh, in other words, it's uh, other Greek words, and uh, perhaps that it could be that the reason why they ended with verses 9 through 20 is because really the end of Mark's gospel would be verse 8, and it would simply just say, so they went out quickly, fled from the tomb, and they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. But we don't have that here. Now, what we find in the account here is actually recorded in the other three Gospels. And remember as well, there's a note here to Peter. And the note here to Peter is, you know, go and tell the disciples and, you know, and, 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 and Peter, um, you know, at the close of it, remember that, Jesus had told Mary, go tell the disciples, go tell Peter. And so we see a note there. Now remember that Mark wrote this gospel from Peter's account as well. So that's just a footnote there in that. So I don't, I don't really see a big deal with verses 9 through 20, whether they are in the original text or not. But I could tell you that in these couple of verses, we will see several things. Number one, we're going to see the great king emerges to the devoted. The great king emerges to the devoted. And then we're going to see that the great king emerges to the stubborn. And then we'll see the great king emerges to those reluctant to believe in him. So I think there's still much to learn from these accounts because they're taken from the other gospels. And so we'll work our way through the rest of the text. So it's kind of an interesting thing. You know, these verses deal with unbelief. So my question to myself was, David, do you believe or do you not believe that these verses are real? <laughs> well, I believe that they are. I believe that they're encouraging verses. And um, I've never read any of the earliest manuscripts, so I wouldn't know. But what I do know is that they're biblical verses because you can find these references in the other gospels. So that we will say. So in all of this here, we see in verse 9, it says, Now when he, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared 
first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Now, it's interesting here that we see that Mark, at the close of the Gospel of Mark, draws attention to the devotion of Mary of Magdala. Now, remember, Mary Magdalene, the Bible says, had a encounter with Jesus. And the Bible says here that Mary of Magdala had a need in her life that, that really no one could help with. In chapter 8 of Luke's gospel, the Bible says, Now it came to pass afterward that he, talking about Jesus, went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tiding of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And a certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, called uh, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Now, this sister here, Mary, if you will, we can call her that, Sister Mary. Uh, her last name is not uh, Magdalene. Most people call her that, like that's her first and last name. But she's actually from a city called Mag Magdala. So that's kind of where your last name comes from. It comes from whatever city you kind of came from. They didn't use last names in the Bible. And so Mary, there was a lot of Marys. Well, which Mary? Mary of Magdala. Mary, uh, you know, Jesus' mother, or there were several Marys. And, but notice here, Mary of Magdala, not only do we know is she from the city of Magdala, she also had seven demons casted out of her. Now just think about that. Um, you know, think about seven demons controlling you. I mean, if you go into Luke's, I mean, um, Luke's account in, in the book of Acts, remember in Acts chapter 19, Luke talks about this story of the seven sons of Sceva. Seven sons came encounter with one demon. Here you have seven demons in one person. And remember what that one demon did to the seven sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19? Well, when they try to go and cast this demon out, remember the seven sons of Sceva, they were, they were exorcists. They try to, they try to go and, and use the words like some people use, you know, Christian words. We call it Christianese. You, you learn the lingo. And these guys made, you know, a living off of that. So they would go around and they were, you know, trying to exercise demons and perform miracles. And so they finally come in contact with a demon-possessed man, the Bible says. And ultimately, they say, you know, we, 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 we cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. They didn't even say in the name of Jesus whom they believe or they, they said whom Paul preaches. And the demon responds to that. And the demon says... Jesus we know, and Paul we know, but who are you? And then the Bible says that that one man that was demon-possessed overtook these seven men, and it says, and they fled the house beaten and naked. The seven sons of Sceva, fake exorcists, not filled with the Holy Spirit, tried to do the work of God just in word but without faith and belief. But then think about that. One demon overpowering seven men. Think about how... Um, you know, distraught and tormented this woman, Mary, who is not a man, but is a woman who is possessed by seven of those demons. You could only imagine what her life was like. Well, one we do know for sure is that she was a sinful woman. Many have even gone as far as to say that the reason why Mary of Magdala uh, had these seven demons in her is because she was a prostitute. Now, it's interesting, historically, you can study the city of Magdala. There is no known prostitutes in biblical times ever coming from that city. And where this assertion or assumption came from, it's not in the Bible. As a matter of fact, we also see that um, in John's gospel, in chapter 8, remember the woman that was caught in the act of adultery and they wanted Jesus to condemn her to death right there on the spot, right? And, and uh, Jesus really took the religious leaders to task. He knew he was being set up by them. He knew actually that the lady was innocent and that she was, you know, just sucked into this evil scheme of these 
uh, religious leaders. But what's interesting is some have come to the conclusion that that perhaps was Mary of Magdala. Uh, that is not the case because she was not a prostitute. Mary of Magdala was a woman who had seven demons that literally possessed her. So whether it was revealed by multiple personalities or she was just some crazy woman, what we do know is that she was possessed by demons. She was a sinner. And it also says here, she was healed of evil spirits, listen to this, and infirmities. So she was also sick. There were sicknesses, whatever that was. And so we see here that Jesus healed her. So this woman, Mary of Magdala, as we look at the story here in Mark's gospel, we see that she is one of the first women at the tomb of Jesus. As a matter of fact, in, in uh, Luke chapter 8, it says, "...in Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many other who provided for him from their sustenance." So not only was she delivered and not only was she healed, she actually provided for Jesus and his ministry. She was a part of it. She was there at the cross when Jesus was, you know, was being crucified. She was there when, when Pilate, uh, you know, condemned him to death. She was there when, when Jesus was, uh, you know, mocked and, and beaten by the officials of the priest and the soldiers. Mary of Magdala, listen to this, unlike the disciples, didn't flee. She stayed as close as she could to Jesus, even in his great hour of need. I would say, just for a moment, if I could insert a thought, you know, when the Bible says, to whom much has been forgiven, they loveth much. When you've been forgiven of a lot, boy, you are grateful to the Lord, right? Well, think about having seven demons in you. Think about having sickness, and you don't know where it's coming from. Think about, you know, being a sinner and being a woman and being ostracized, you know, from the community. Think about it. Jesus actually gave her life. Jesus gave her meaning. Jesus healed her. He delivered her. He set her free. He gave her position among the women that followed Jesus. He, he gave her an ability to serve in his ministry. She provided from what sustenance, we don't know. But either way, it says there that she, along with these other women, provided so in a sense, you could see that she wasn't going to let go of Jesus. To whom much has been forgiven, they loveth much. She loved Jesus. She was devoted to Jesus. And let me tell you something. The cross didn't scare her. The tomb didn't scare her. Nothing scared her. Mary, here it says, came to the tomb. Now remember that ultimately... Mary was the first to go and tell the disciples that the tomb was empty. Then we have the account in which, in John's gospel, that the disciples come back with her to see, and then they leave, and she remains there. Look at this, Acts chapter, or excuse me, John chapter 20. Turn there very quickly, and we're going to look at this account here in verse 11. So in verses 1 through 10, we see here that on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, and that's what we read last time here in Mark's gospel, and it says here, and she saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb, and she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciples. So she said, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So we know the story. Peter and John, they go to the tomb, they go themselves, they look in, and what do they see? They don't see. They're marveling. And the disciples, well, they didn't know that the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. Now, remember, they didn't put two and two together. So then it says, look at verse 10. The disciples went away again to their homes. Now, look at what she does. But Mary stood. Mary remained. This is why you see in all four accounts, Mary of Magdala emphasized because the disciples had a reputation from the time that Jesus was arrested up until this point here of constantly leaving Jesus, constantly going away. Mary, on the other hand, has a reputation that's opposite of the disciples. She remains. She goes back. She, she then stays here, and it says here she stayed outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down, looked into the tomb, 
And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had laid. She's there, she's looking, she's seen what both Peter and John seen, but what was the difference between Mary and these two disciples? Remember, this is, this is of the three. Remember, Peter, James, and John were the three that were always with Jesus. And here's two out of the three, and they just went back home. They went back to their own homes. But Mary stood and she remained. That's the difference between the two. She had no desire to go anywhere else but to know where Jesus was. And many people ask the question, why did Jesus appear to Mary? Why couldn't he appear to one of the three that he discipled, Peter, James, and John? There's a difference here. Mary never left Jesus. She remained committed. She remained faithful. She remained there. To whom much has been forgiven, they loveth much. It was love. For Jesus. And though she didn't understand either, she was seeking understanding. She was seeking. She was seeking the Lord. She was seeking Jesus. It, it's an interesting thing because, you know, I remember reading a story. I got a kick out of it of a guy and a barber having a conversation in a barber shop. And the conversation, if any of you guys have ever gone to a hair salon or a barber shop, you know, that's a lot of this in there, you know, so you're talking. And the, anyways, the guy's there, he's getting his hair cut, he's talking to his barber, and the next thing you know, the barber, various conversations about life and different things, and then finally the topic of God comes up. So the guy that's getting his hair cut is a Christian, and the barber is an atheist. And he says, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in what you believe. He says, why don't you believe in God? He goes, just look out there. Go out there to the street right now. There's people dying. There's people sick. There's people, you know, that have difficulty in life and there's all this turmoil. And if there was truly a God, like you say, there isn't a God of love. And this is the common thing we're always faced with. Then why is that there? Why does that exist? And then the customer turns and looks at the barber and he says, well, I agree with you. Barbers don't exist either. He says, because look at you go out to the street and look at all these people. Their beards are untrimmed. Their mustaches are all crazy. Their hair is all long. And then the barber says to the customer, he says, well, hold on. Here's the problem. Those people over there don't come in here to see me. And the customer stopped him and he says, that is correct. Because you don't see God, you don't see him. Same thing. See, Mary desired to see the Lord. She desired to seek after him and she would not give up. And these two angels she's seen here, Mark only gives us an account of one, but here the two angels, while sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain, then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, listen to this, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Talk about someone that says, I ain't leaving till I get answers. I mean, after all, you think about it, a woman who handles seven demons. We don't know how long she was demon possessed, but she's a pretty tough lady, man. She probably had some muscles. I don't know, but she seemed pretty tough. But it was this spiritual devotion to Jesus. She said, my Lord. This lack of fear. But she demonstrated faith. She demonstrated carrying with the Lord. She demonstrated standing there, remaining there. Now, when he had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus did this quite a bit as he appeared after the resurrection. They didn't recognize him right away. Well, the answer to that is very simple. Jesus was glorified. He was in the glorified body. And so it wasn't until Jesus would reveal, Jesus would deliberately reveal himself to those that would seek him, those that were looking, and even the ones that were not, just to rekindle their faith and to deal with their doubt and their unbelief. With Mary here, she didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping and whom are you seeking? Now remember, the, the two angels asked her this question. She's supposing him, Jesus, to be a gardener. So I'm telling you, the picture of Jesus that looks like a Mexican, that's the Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it 
supposing him to be a gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. Listen to this. Look at what she says here. And I will take him away. You see what she's saying? She's, listen, she's not with the, she's by herself. Peter and John are gone. And she's saying, if you took him away, tell me where he is. And she's saying, I will physically go and pick him up. In her mind, I still want to come and do what I set out to do this morning. Anoint his body, give him a proper burial. Notice that when Jesus seen the love, the devotion, the seeking here, Jesus said to her, Mary, stop right there for a moment. He said, Mary. And the moment that Jesus said her name, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. She recognized. The moment Jesus called her by her name, remember what Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 3? My sheep hear my voice. She heard Jesus. And Jesus said to her, so she goes, and Jesus says, do not cling to me. So this is not a simple hug. She, was, she grabbed Jesus. She, she pressed him. She held on to him. She clung to him. And he says, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. You know that Jesus never put it that way. He would always say the disciples, he calls them his brothers. He also says to my father and your father. He never said your father before. He always said my father. And then he says to my God and to your God. Notice what the resurrection did. Here is the resurrected Lord. And what did he do? He made us a family. He brought us together. Like in John's gospel, remember, as Jesus was up on the cross in chapter 19 and verse 25, he sees his mother there and he sees John the apostle there. And he goes on to say, it goes on to say this, that Jesus says to his mother, a woman, behold your son. And then he says to his disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple, who is John, took her into his home. Jesus had the welfare and the concern of his mother on his mind while he was dying on the cross. And he says, oh, by the way, here's some last minute things, I, loose ends I have to tie up before I go. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And he looked after the care of his mother after he knew he would die on the cross. Well, this is exactly what it is. Families are formed at the cross. Jesus raises from the dead and he says, my brother, my father, you know, our father, my God, our God. And here we see the same thing in verse 17. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. Listen to this. And that he had spoken these things to her. Now, back in Mark's gospel, we turn back there, it says that when she told them, they didn't believe her. Now, there's many reasons why they probably didn't believe her. Well, one, because Peter and John were there at the tomb just earlier, right? And they didn't see it was empty. They didn't see anything in there. So, one, that could be one reason why. Number two, they all, the, in Luke chapter 8, what does it say? All 12 disciples were with Jesus when the evil spirits were casted out of Mary of Magdala, they're probably thinking, she's, she's tripping, bro. Come on, she, had, she was crazy before. She's crazy now. She ain't, you know, who knows? You guys might say, oh, no, the disciples are very spiritual. No, they weren't. They were arguing about who is greatest in the kingdom or who would be the greatest when Jesus was going to the cross and just told them that he was going to die. They were like, well, I'm better than you. No, I'm better than you. No, he loves me more. This is what Jesus was dealing with. You never know. They probably looked at Mary of Magdala and they probably said, she's, she's crazy. We can't believe her. They had no desire to believe. And you know what? In all actuality, what we do see here is that Jesus deliberately, listen to this, guys, revealed himself to her because her desire to want to know where he was and what happened. So the great king emerges to the devoted and if you're devoted, the Lord will deliberately reveal himself more to you. And you might say, well, what does a devoted person look like? A person who had evil spirits and sickness and seven demons casted out of them. A person who has been forgiven of much, they love much. 
And notice, what did she do? She didn't doubt. The moment she heard Jesus call her by her name, she recognized her Lord. She recognized her Savior. And just like she said she would do, show me where they have laid him because I will go and I will, I will take him myself. She grabbed him. She did exactly what she said she would do. And she went and told those who had been with him, and they mourned and wept. You know, her grief and their grief for a moment blinded them. But her persistency brought revelation to her. Why? I'll tell you why. Because her simple faith, her courage, and her love in action she was devoted to Jesus. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Perhaps sorrow. Perhaps because she was a sinner with a troubled past. Either way, that's okay. There are people today that will not believe the gospel message. They'll think you're crazy. They'll think you're wild. They'll think something happened to you. They'll think you got high and you never came off your high. But you want to know what? Over time, listen to this. We, like Mary of Magdala, might have been known as crazy, sick, and evil. But we don't leave Jesus. We stay the course. Listen to this. God always brings circumstances in our lives to bring us to believe and to faith. With the disciples, he does the same. Look at, we go on here, the second point in verses 12 through 13, we see here that the great king emerges to the stubborn. You ever met a stubborn person? It says, after that, he appeared in other form to two of them as they walked and went into the country and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Now, remember, these two, the story is found in Luke chapter 24. Turn there very quickly, and let's see the story of these two. These are the two guys on the road to Emmaus. Now, these disciples here, we talked a little bit about this. Well, for one, they were going the wrong way. They're walking away from Jerusalem. We'll see the story as it picks up here. But I think it's an interesting thing to, to take note of here. Verse 13 of chapter 24 this is what it says. It says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. Now there's many reasons why some believe that they were going to Emmaus. Number one, they were just simply leaving Jerusalem. What they expected of Jesus didn't materialize. What they thought they were going to get from him didn't happen. He died on the cross. He was laid in the tomb. They all seen it. And their savior of you know, their life or their little world is gone. Many people follow Jesus for certain things that they feel they need to get from him. Nobody, you know, realizes that to follow Jesus, oftentimes, especially those people, don't realize that to follow Jesus means to give him your life and he will forgive you of your sins. And ultimately, that's what we get from the Lord, forgiveness of sins. But people follow Jesus like, you know, they're going to get a prize or they're going to get, you know, rewarded or they're going to get certain things taken care of in their own. And so and people present a gospel that way falsely and make people believe if you just come to Jesus, all your problems will go away. No, they won't. If anything, it gets worse. But who wants to hear a message of come to faith in Christ and guess what? <laughs> your days are going to get really bad. No, listen to this. Your days are going to get bad regardless because we live in a fallen world. The difference between you receiving Jesus and not receiving Jesus is how we live in this life with all of life's circumstances and situations. You can either walk through all of those circumstances in life with Jesus or you can walk alone. And most people often say that. Yeah, life hasn't got easier, but I have the Lord with me now. There's a difference in how we handle things. Some people like the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the 5,000, right? Upwards of about what? 12,000 upwards to about 20,000 in each of those cases. And what did they all follow Jesus for? Those people weren't at the cross. They followed him because they got a free meal. In John chapter 6, when Jesus preached a powerful message, eat my flesh and drink my blood, the people got all tripped out. And the Bible says that day, many of the disciples, upwards of 500 walked away from Jesus. 
people follow Jesus for the wrong reasons. These two disciples kind of have this same mindset. And they're going to Emmaus. The city of Emmaus is known more as a political city. It's outside of Jerusalem. It's, it's west of Jerusalem. It's outside. They're leaving the city. Why? Because what they had in Jerusalem is gone because Jesus is dead. And the Bible goes on to say here that they traveled to a city called Emmaus. Now, this city, here's another thought later on as I studied. You know, this is historically where they felt their, you know, victor would come from. It was a political city where they would raise up a political leader. That's what they wanted. They wanted a political savior. Perhaps maybe these two disciples are going back there to reconvene, pray, perhaps maybe think, well, this was not the one that was going to save his people. They wanted Jesus to save in a different way. They wanted him to remove Rome. Jesus didn't come to overthrow Rome. He came to overthrow men's hearts. Jesus came to deal with the heart of the matter. And what is the heart of the matter? It's the heart itself. And look at what happens here. While they talked together all these things which, they, which had happened, so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, like Mary, they didn't recognize Jesus, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Notice that it's not that Jesus didn't know. Jesus knew exactly what they were talking about. Listen to this. You might think like, wow, okay, so Jesus sees them on the road. Yes, he does. Jesus knows where his sheep are going. They're leaving. Yes, but all the other disciples are in the upper room, 120 of them, right, on the day of Pentecost are in the upper room, and they're still at Jerusalem. Remember what Jesus said? That a good shepherd, what does he do? He leaves the 99 and goes after the one. If Jesus would have never went after these two disciples that were leaving and everybody else was there, then Jesus would have been a bad example of what he said. Jesus truly is leaving the 99 and going after the two. He's going after these disciples here. And, and listen to this. What Jesus is highlighting is not that he doesn't know what they're talking about. He's revealing their heart to them. He says, you're doing a lot of talking and you're doing a lot of walking, but here's the reality. You're sad. Their, listen to this, guys. Their disposition showed their frustration, their conversation showed their heart. And when one of those whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Wow. And you have not known the things which happened there in these days? He said to them, what things? I love how Jesus engages us. Do tell. They're like, where have you been? You're a stranger, you know? And Jesus is like, yeah, okay, sure. So what, what are you talking about? Tell me. And listen, he wanted to hear. He wanted to hear. Listen. It's not that Jesus didn't know what was in their heart. You know, sometimes when we speak, we learn a lot about ourselves. And so they begin to speak and they begin to say things concerning. They're like Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet. Listen to this mighty indeed and word before God and all the people and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all of this today is the third day since the things happened. Yes, and certain women. What woman is that? Who is that? That's Mary, right? This Mary of Magdala of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that he had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women said. That was Peter and John, right? And they didn't see him. Then he said to them, listen to this, O foolish ones, and slow of heart. You see the word there, slow? It's the word dull, dull of heart. To believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? What is he referring them to? He's referring them to the word of God. He says, you shouldn't be surprised by this. This is what the scripture spoke about. This is what Jesus said would happen. Jesus, on more than one occasion, especially in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 8, verse 31, Mark chapter 9, verse 31, and Mark chapter 10 and verse 33. Three times Jesus said, I will be delivered up, I will be arrested, I will be crucified, I will be killed, and on the third day, I will rise again. So he's telling these disciples, Jesus told you more than once. I told you more than once. They didn't know it was him, but listen to this, and you don't know. And beginning at Moses 
meaning beginning at Moses, the books that Moses wrote. He's coined for what? Writing the Pentateuch, right? The first five books of the Bible, right? So beginning at the beginning of the Bible and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Imagine Jesus giving you a Bible study and saying, that verse talking about me. That verse, they still didn't know it was him. So he's giving them this Bible study as they're still walking away from Jerusalem. Listen, Jesus doesn't stop them. He doesn't pull them back. Jesus actually is walking with them as they further distance themselves from the epicenter of where it all took place. Because Jesus is long-suffering. Jesus is walking alongside them and he's, he's sharing with them the word of God. Then they drew near to the village where they were going. And he, Jesus, indicated he would have gone farther, but they constrained him. Interesting word. Circle it. Write it down. Take a picture. Do whatever you got to do. But look at this. They constrained him. What did Mary do? She stood there. She went back. She didn't leave. These guys constrained him. And look at what they said. Abide with us, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. Something happened. First they said, are you a stranger? Where you been? You, haven't heard, you, you don't know what's going on here? Now they're saying, hey, you want to stay the night with us? And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. I love this. You don't think that in their mind they were probably remembering the last meal that they had with Jesus in Matthew 26 as he instituted the Lord's Supper, and here Jesus is now with these two disciples, and he's breaking bread with them. Listen to this, guys. And he blessed it, and he broke it, and he, you don't think that that for a moment there, they just heard the word, they're probably sitting there like, man, this just feels so right. You ever meet someone, you just look at them, you're like, I just feel like I've known you for a long time. It just feels so, you know, normal with you. It feels just so right. Listen, and their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Jesus opened their eyes to see him for who he was, and when they realized it was Jesus, boom, he was gone. And they said to one another, listen to this, guys. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Did not our hearts burn within us? If their hearts were burning within them, they would have stayed in Jerusalem, but their hearts were no longer burning within them. They were, they were leaving. They were, and what did he do? He gave them the word of God. Their hearts reignited. And what did they do? They believed. They were stubborn. They were walking away. And Jesus emerges and reveals himself to these two. And the Bible says in verse 33, I love this. It says, and they rose up the very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Listen, they didn't waste no time. The moment that Jesus revealed himself to them and they realized Jesus now is raised from the dead, he's alive, what did they do? The Bible says they didn't bother to stay the night. They were so ecstatic and overjoyed that Jesus was raised from the dead as well. And what happened? Immediately they went back. They went back to Jerusalem. They walked all the way back. And this time, listen to this, they understood this, that Jesus was walking with them. Jesus was walking with them. They knew that Jesus had not left them, that he had been raised from the dead. The fact that they knew that Jesus was alive, risen from the dead, they knew that Jesus was present and in their midst. And they went back. So verse 12 in Mark chapter 16 says, after that he appeared to another other form to two of them as they walked and went into the country and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them. They went that same night. Now we see here that Jesus emerges to those reluctant to believe. Now this is just Mary of Magdala. We have the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and now we have the eleven. Before, they were always called the Twelve. Remember that Judas Iscariot had killed himself already by this time, taken his life because of betraying Jesus. And it says here in verse 14, Later he appeared to the eleven 
as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Notice what Jesus rebuked. He appeared to them and he rebuked them. Now, remember what John's gospel says in John chapter 20, Jesus appears to the disciples in the upper room. And I love this picture because it just reminds us of, of what Jesus came to do. The Bible says in verse 19 of John chapter 20, then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut. This is the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. He's now appearing to the disciples in the upper room. Just hours earlier, he was risen from the dead, so to speak. And it says, and the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled. Listen to this, for fear of the Jews. They thought the Jews were going to get them next. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. And when, they, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw that it was the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, listen to this. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This was the promise of the Father. Remember in John chapter 14 in verses 16 and 26, Jesus said that he was going to pray to the Father, send another comforter. And then Jesus also said, I must go so he can come. This is the promise of the Father. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 14 that he will be with you always. That's the forever abidance of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was active, but he didn't forever abide. The Holy Spirit would empower someone, would equip someone, but then when that person would, you know, flee from obedience, or flee in obedience to God's word as they just rejected God's word, the Spirit would depart from them, just like Saul, the first king that Israel had. The Spirit of the Lord empowered him, but the moment that Saul started to do things his way and disregarded the word of the Lord, David is the one that gives us this accounting of it. He's seen the Spirit of the Lord depart from Saul, and then a distressing spirit came upon Saul. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Well, when the Spirit of God departs under the old covenant, listen to this, guys, then a distressing spirit comes. And what happens? You no longer have the presence of the Lord. You no longer have that peace. You no longer have that joy. And then David would play his harp, right? And that was the only thing, that playing of the harp. Why? Because David was a man after God's own heart. David really was a worshiper of the Lord he had nearness to the Lord God, and whatever David played on that harp, it ministered to Saul. It, it, it reminded him of being near to the Lord, and it brought a peace upon him. And ultimately, remember later on when David sinned, like Saul, David sinned as well. But what was the difference? Saul wasn't a man after God's heart. David was. David might have been a great sinner, but he was also a great repenter. And what David did was... In Psalm 51, David wrote that famous psalm to the Lord. And he said to the Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Why did he say that? Because he knew what happened to Saul when the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. He went down really fast. David might have committed a great sin, but David was repenting in that prayer because he paid dearly for the sin with Bathsheba. And he wrote Psalm 51 as a result of it. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me, right? He says, cast me not away from your presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, but restore unto me the joy of your salvation. He didn't say restore your spirit. He still had the spirit of God in him. Even when he was committing that adultery, even when he murdered her husband, the spirit of God was in him. It never departed him. And that's why he wrote Psalm 32. And he said, here's what happens when you have unconfessed sin in your life. The Spirit of God convicted him. And Psalm 32, he says, my bones were hurting. My body was aching. He says, physically, I was going through things and my body could not take this unconfessed sin. And ultimately, the Lord gave him a year to confess it and he didn't until he rebuked him with the prophet, right? And he exposed him. God always gives us opportunity to repent. But that work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, listen to this, is the very thing that indwells the believer. Now, under the old covenant, as I said before, in the Old Testament, the Spirit came and went as he pleased in God's vessels. Under the New Testament, Jesus makes a promise that is under the new covenant. It's a new promise. It's a new thing that God is doing. And Jesus said this, and he, the paracleto, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, parakletos in the Greek, 
will be with you always. That's something new because he was never with them always. He came and went as he pleased. Under the new covenant, he forever abides in us. And the Bible says in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 13, and also Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. He doesn't depart us once he indwells us. We belong to the Lord. I believe here that the disciples were born again for the first time. The Spirit indwelt them. Now they became born-again believers because of the forever abidance of the Holy Spirit. And people have asked this question. They say, wow, so that's when the Holy Spirit, yes, that's when they became born again. In the book of Acts, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We call it the para en epi. Para means to come alongside. John chapter 14, the Holy Spirit will come alongside you. Para, that means to come alongside. And the word kletos means to comfort. That's why we see the Greek word for comforter in John chapter 14. That word is parakletos. That means para to come alongside to comfort kletos. That's exactly what it means. But here in John chapter 20 in verse 22, he says receive the Holy Spirit. That word receive in the Greek is the Greek word en. It means an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's what he was doing. He was indwelling them with the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts chapter 1, he reiterates what he said in the close of Luke's gospel in chapter 24 when he commands them, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And in Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, he says, that which the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Now that word upon in the Greek is the Greek word epi, E-P-I. That means an overflowing of the Holy Spirit equipping you for the work of the ministry, and the book of Acts just, boom, just takes off. Really, the book of Acts is not the Acts of the Apostles. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And today, the church still empowers the church by way of the Holy Spirit. But this is what's happening here. Jesus tells the disciples here, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say this in verse 23. And I think this is important. For if you forgive the sins of any, we don't forgive people's sins. Remember when... The guys, uh, these guys that had a friend who was like, he was all jacked up, man. I don't know what he, if he was quadriplegic or what, but they wanted to get him into the house, right? And so the house is crowded. Jesus is in there preaching. And like Mary and like, uh, you know, the two on Emmaus, you know, they constrained Jesus. Mary stayed there. Well, these guys are like, we're going to get him in there. So they climb up, you know, little stairway going to the top of the house because the house is in Jerusalem the, 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 the roofs are flat because the, week, uh, the Feast of Booths, they still practice this today. They build little huts and little tents, and for a whole week they live in there because it's that remembrance, the Feast of, of Sukkoth, the Feast of Booths. It's the time in which they were in the wilderness and God provided for them, and they still practice that to this day. And, and what's interesting is they, so they go up, they take their buddy up there, they get up on the top of the roof, and then they start to peel it back piece by piece ripping a hole in it, and they figure, we'll just send him down in the middle. So can you imagine, you know, in a room like this, and while I'm teaching, Jesus is not distracted by what's going on. I'm more than certain there's stuff falling from the ceiling. And, and this is why, you know, people usually prefer to sit in the front because they don't want to be distracted with people in the back because you want to know what? We barely hear those doors cling open, and you guys start turning around. You start rubbernecking in church, like, you know, what's going on here? Don't worry. Nothing's going to get you. I got my eyes behind you. So trust me, if I see something's going to get you, I'm going to say, watch out. <laughs> That's all. Don't worry about it. So don't turn around no more. Okay. We got it. You trust me. Okay, good. So stop looking around. All right. So they weren't looking around. Stuff's falling down. Most likely Jesus is teaching. He's not moved by it. And all of a sudden here comes this guy right down the middle. And Jesus uses this in his sermon. He says, hey, your sins are forgiven you. And the people marvel, who is this man that forgives sins? Only God can forgive sins. They didn't make the connection. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. Then they get upset. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus says, well, what's better? That I heal him? Physically? Ultimately, he's going to die and then go to hell. But what if I forgive his sins and he dies? He will spend eternity in the presence of the Lord. The healing's going to come either way. Because, hey, I think a lot of times we don't realize this. 
Yes, in heaven, there's no more sorrow. There's no more sickness. There's no more disease. There's no more, right? But also in hell, listen, there's no more sickness. There's no more disease. But there is pain and there is sorrow and there is torment. Either way, you will be healed of your malady and be in hell forever or in the presence of the Lord rejoicing. The healing's going to come either way. This physical body remains here until the resurrection. Think, guys, come on. Jesus is pulling this out of them. They're sitting there, they're like, whoa, this is some deep teaching. It's just real. I'm going to forgive his sins because this is the greatest healing this man could ever receive. And I'm going to tell you what, his buddies put him down there not for his sins to be forgiven, for their buddy to be healed. They wanted to go play soccer, man. They needed five guys on the team and their buddy couldn't do nothing. That's just my paraphrase. I'm sorry. But here's the point. Jesus heals him. Jesus heals him. Now listen to this. Jesus not only heals him, Jesus forgives him of his sins. And Jesus is telling the disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Have you ever heard me go around and go to someone and just say, your sins are forgiven you. Go and sin no more. No. But we do say this because of Christ and because of what he did at Calvary's cross, your sins can be forgiven. Because of what, this is exactly what Jesus is saying. In a sense, this is a very short and powerful and profound version of the Great Commission. Now go and tell the whole world. The power is there. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. If you believe God for them being delivered, if you believe God. Listen, this is the whole same idea. Listen to this by... When, when Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. In other words, if we do it according to the scriptures, heaven testifies of it. It's not called the binding and the loosing. As some people go and they go around and I bind this and I bind that. And I release faith and I release healing and the binding and the loosing. And they're doing all this weird false teaching. That's not in the Bible. That's what Jesus is talking about, <laughs> really, uh, when you look at Matthew chapter 18 and he's talking about the binding and loosing and he's talking about the two agreeing um, and all of that, Jesus is talking about church discipline. He's talking about, you know, whatever you say is going to be recognized in heaven. It'll be a testimony. It'll be a witness if it's done biblically. That's all it's talking about. But we have the power to go and share the message. And what did Paul say? It's my job to preach. It's the Spirit's job to demonstrate. Here, Jesus is saying, now you have the ability for the Spirit to demonstrate. That's pretty powerful. So in all of this here, Jesus rebukes them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart. Listen to this. They never left. Remember what Jesus said in chapter 14 in verse 28? What did he say to them? He says, I will meet you where? He says, we're going to, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to where? Galilee. Boy, they're in the upper room. They're scared. They're afraid. They haven't moved. Jesus rebukes them because on three separate occasions, he says, I will be raised from the dead. He also said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. They're afraid. Jesus then, they receive the Holy Spirit. And now the disciples know that Jesus is risen from the dead. And listen to this, guys. It says here, and because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So he's saying here, listen, you knew. I told you. I told you one of you was going to betray me. There's only 11 of you. Look at this. He goes on to say here, and I told you that I would rise from the dead. So Jesus rebukes them for their unbelief. It's interesting how some people, even with all the evidences around them, don't believe in the Lord. They struggle with belief in God. It reminds me of a story of a guy named Joe Condon who was walking through the woods admiring all the accidents that evolution created. Joe said, what majestic trees, what powerful rivers, what beautiful animals. And he said to himself, as he was walking alongside the river, he heard a rustling in the bushes behind him. Turning to look, he saw a seven-foot grizzly bear charging towards him. He ran away as fast as he could up the path, and he looked over his shoulder, and he saw the grizzly, and he was closing in. And somehow, he ran even faster, so scared that tears came to his eyes. 
He looked again and the bear was even closer and his heart was pounding and he tried to run faster and he tripped and he fell to the ground and he rolled over to pick himself up but the bear was right over him, reaching for him with his left paw and raising its right paw to strike him. At that instant, Joe cried out, Oh God, help me! Time stopped. The bear froze. The forest was silent. The river even stopped moving. And as a bright light shone upon Joe, a voice came out of the sky. You deny my existence for all these years. You teach others that I don't exist. And even credit creation to a cosmic accident. Do you expect me to help you out of this predicament? Am I to count you as a believer, Joe? Joe Condon looked directly into the light and said, I would feel like a hypocrite to become a Christian after all these years. But perhaps you could make the bear a Christian. The voice said, very well. The light went out. The river began to run again. The sounds of the forest resumed. The bear dropped his right paw, brought both paws together, bowed his head and spoke to the Lord and said, Lord, for this food which I'm about to receive, I am truly thankful. There are some people that just will never believe, but thank God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God sends us out because the Spirit is what convicts men's hearts. Sometimes we're reluctant to take steps of faith and believe the Lord for great things. These men walked with Jesus. They heard three times Jesus saying that he would rise from the dead. They had Mary of Magdala come and say, look, the tomb is empty. They went, they looked. Listen to this, guys. And not only that, the two on the road to Emmaus came in and they weren't believed. And all of those that were close to Jesus were there. And this is why Jesus rebuked them. They were in fear. And after Jesus breathed the spirit upon them and their fear became courage. Verse 15 says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus gives them these orders. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now notice this. I think sometimes people misinterpret this verse and they say, oh, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. That's not what he's saying. Baptism is not what saves us. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say, oh, hold on, stop. We've got to take these nails out. I've got to baptize you because if we don't, it doesn't stick, bro. No, listen to this, guys. Pay attention to what Jesus is saying here. Listen to this. He who believes, where do we believe? We believe in the heart and is baptized, meaning what? With an outward sign. If a person truly believes, he's going to have a desire to be baptized. If he doesn't believe, he would have no desire to be baptized. As a matter of fact, I'll take it a step further. What did Paul the Apostle say? He says, I am thankful that I didn't baptize all of you guys. I can count on one hand how many men I've baptized. And Paul the Apostle, listen, who wrote majority of the New Testament says, God didn't call me to baptize, he called me to preach. And here's another footnote for some of you. Read the Gospels. Jesus didn't baptize, but his disciples did. Jesus doesn't give us a great commission of baptism. He gives us a great commission of preaching the gospel. Baptism is an outward manifestation of an inward reality of your faith in Christ Jesus, something that has already taken place, past tense, is now being lived out in practice outwardly to show others that you belong to the Lord. Go into all the world. He didn't say go to some places. He says all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized, listen to this, will be saved. Now, I think this is an interesting point because, guys, I want you to know here what Jesus is saying. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Notice that it's the lack of faith, not baptism, that condemns a man. Interesting. Sometimes it's just good just to read the verses a little bit slowly and hear what Jesus is saying. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that Jesus gave two sacraments to the church, one of them communion, the other baptism, and as obedient Christians, we are to observe and practice both. 
He goes on to say here, and these signs will follow those who believe. Notice the benefits of believing. Number one, one of the signs is that they will get baptized. They will want to get baptized. People that are true believers have a desire to be in fellowship with Jesus. Look at Mary of Magdala. She wanted to be with Jesus, even though that Jesus was what? Dead. She's like, I want to go to the tomb. And guess what? It's empty. Everybody goes home. And what does she do? She stays there. Why? Because she believed in Jesus. You see, belief changes everything, guys. It changes who you are. Listen, if you say that you're a believer and you don't read your word and you don't pray and listen, I'm going to be straightforward and you're not plugged in at your church. If this is your church, you better be plugged in. You better be attending Bible studies and serving in the body of Christ. That's, those are evidences of you being a, a person who appreciates fellowship with the Lord. It behooves me when I see people say, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm burned out in ministry. I need a break. I've been serving God 16 years with no vacation. Preach four times on Sunday. Come back midweek study. Go and preach other places, conferences, fly, different places, go around. I do trips to Israel every year. I don't vacation or relax. I preach sermons every day that I'm in Israel, sometimes twice a day. I'm preparing studies, and then I go and teach. Well, everybody else is having their fun. God bless it, but I'm there to teach the word of God. I never get tired of it. Never. There's no. They say, well, you don't get burned out. No, because I don't do ministry in the flesh. If I do it in the flesh, I'm going to get tired. If I do it in the flesh, I'm going to get weary. If I do it in the flesh, I'm going to become overwhelmed and discouraged. But what I do for the Lord is done under the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't deny that what God has done through this ministry and in my life and for those that serve faithfully, listen, is a work of the Holy Spirit. We couldn't do this in our own accord even if we wanted to. There's no way. You would kill yourself. So how long are you going to do this until the Lord says, David, it's time to go home. If he takes me home in my 40s, I'm gone. If he waits till my 50s or 60s, I'll go whenever he says I'm done here. But ultimately, guys, listen to this. We have the ability to go and do for the Lord. And I want to encourage you guys. Listen, you want to receive from the Lord. Listen, if you have true faith in God, you're going to have a desire to do the thing. It's the least you can do for the Lord. It's the least you can do for the Lord. And never serve God like these two on the road to Emmaus expecting something from the Lord. It's the least you can do for him. He who believes in me and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. Notice here the term believe in verse 17. In the original Greek language, it means those who have believed, not just because you believe these things will happen. No, have believed, meaning past tense, that they've been walking now. And there's signs that will follow in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak new tongues. These things have already happened. We see very clearly here in first Corinthians chapter 12 in verses 29 and 30. In second Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 12, what happens? It says they were what? able to speak in new tongues and do this work of the ministry, miraculous works, things that we could never do in our own accord. Then it goes on to say here, they will take up serpents. Acts chapter 28, what happened when that serpent bit Paul? He just shook it off. He didn't die. He just shook it off. They marveled. They thought like he was some kind of God because the serpent didn't kill him. But the Bible says here, you're protected by God. You're under the power of the Holy Spirit. You're doing a work for the Lord God. Listen to this. And it even goes on to say here, and if they drink anything deadly. Now, we don't have no scriptural references of somebody drinking anything deadly. But the point being made is that God will protect you. God will take care of you. That doesn't mean you go and test God. And you start church like they do back down south, you know, and they got rattlesnakes all up in there, you know, and during the worship service, they get, they pull them out of the thing and they start doing, hey, heck no, man, I ain't doing that. <laughs> You're crazy. Like, listen, it doesn't say to be careless. It says to be led by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, they even had a TV show about that. You guys see the TV show of the family that that's what they did with the, you know, you guys are spiritual. You don't have a TV. You're like, no, that's television. Eh? It's not television. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> But anyways, look, 
you know, they, they did this. And you want to know what? I think now, I think the dad died, the son died. Well, no, go figure. They got bit by rattlesnakes. What happens? You die. But they take this verse, and they're like, no, it says it in Mark chapter 16. We can take up serpents. We can drink poison. But then you tell them, like, well, yeah, but that was later inserted in the second century. So it was never really part of the, you're just doing what you want to do. You're trying to manufacture a work of the Holy Spirit. What it's saying is, don't go look for evil and put yourself in dangerous situations. But if you find yourself in these situations, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you, amen? Remember I was telling you guys, I think it was last week, I don't remember when I said when we went to Haiti and several times we went there. I've probably been to Haiti about maybe 13, 14 times since we started the Bible college out there. But remember I told you we've had some crazy experiences out there and I was talking about people, you know, that they're trying to stone us and they throw rocks at us and do all these things, you know, and so on and so forth. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting um, is we just had a team that we prayed for that was over there in Haiti and one of the things that happened was they says immediately when they left the airport that they um, were, were sabotaged. Um, Pastor Dave through you, his wife and his daughter and some of the young ladies from the church were almost taken hostage. And um, they gathered around them. They began to pick up stones and they were going to stone them to death right there on the spot. And the students from the Bible training center started talking to the people and calmed the crowd down and they let them go. And so they've been in, at the Bible training center in there. You know, he's like, bro, he's texting me. He's like, bro, pray, bro. These people try to take us out. I says, well, hey, look, it's, you guys knew how dangerous it was, but you're going there to do the Lord's work. You will go in, you'll do it, and you'll come out. Trust the Lord. The Lord's with you. Whether it's a serpent or a mob of people. When I go to other countries... When I go to other places of the world, and listen, and I'm there maybe just with one other person, and we're by ourselves, and we're out, and we don't know nobody there. And they're persecuting Christians. They're killing them. We go into those areas to preach the gospel because nobody else will go. And you don't realize, guys, listen, you don't realize this whole cute Christianity that we have here, you know, where you have no worries. Your only concern is, you know, maybe an electricity bill getting cut off or something, and you think it's trial. No, you just didn't pay your bill. You're not a good steward with your resources. You're a bad steward. And the problems that you think you have are probably problems you started because you don't know how to keep your mouth shut. And the reason why there's probably issues in your life is because you're the one that are causing these issues and you're saying you're persecuted. You don't know what persecution is. Go talk to women who've had their mothers and their daughters raped in front of them and their, and their dad's heads chopped off because they put their faith in Christ. And then you go and try to tell them like, oh, I was just going through it at the church, you know, because you know, the brothers, you know, they don't like me there, you know, or the, or the sisters are, come on, guys, give me a break. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of the gospel. And there are people out there that are going into eternity without knowing Jesus. And Jesus is saying, it's your job, it's my job to go and tell them that Jesus loves them. But you want to know what? You like the cute little phrase believer. You like the cute little not of this world stickers and all your cute little things that you wear. But let me tell you something. None of that matters when you're in the midst of adversity in your midst of trial. And the reason why you have no power is because you're not led by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why you're burning out is because you're doing it in the flesh. You're not reading your word. You're not praying. You're not fasting. You're not seeking the Lord. This is just a game. It's just a fad. You come to church. It becomes part of your ritual. You're not serving Jesus. You're serving yourself because this is part of the list of what you do. Now, I'm going to be straightforward with you guys. I will assure you that we think there's a lot of people going to heaven. You're going to be surprised as to who not, who's not there, and you'll be surprised as to who is there. And I'll tell you this. Christianity is not about me and you. I preach the gospel and I do what I do for the Lord because God delivered me. He set me free. I'm not who I used to be. It's not anything I could have done. It's what the Lord does. And God made himself known to me in a way that nobody could ever change my mind. And I've never doubted what God's done in my life. But I'll tell you this. The things that you think are adversity, the things that you think are trial, the things that you think are great in your life, they're not. God is. Jesus is. And if you're not living a spirit-filled life, then I don't know what you're living. But you ain't living Christ-like. 
Your job under the power of the Holy Spirit is to be an example of Jesus' grace, Jesus' mercy, the power of the Holy Spirit, the proclamation of the gospel to a world that is dying without Jesus. There's no second chance when your loved one dies, just so you know. There's no second chance for you overlooking the sin in your family and your siblings. Yeah, you call yourself a Christian, but you're hanging out with your siblings and your friends that still party and go do those things. And yeah, you might be the designated driver, but you're still condoning. You're supporting their drunkenness. You're supporting their lifestyle. You're supporting how they live because you're not saying nothing. And you know what? And you call yourself a believer. You might say, oh man, Pastor Dave, we came on the wrong night. No, you came on the right night because some of you are probably not living right. It's the reality and it's the truth. Why did Jesus say this to the disciples? Go into all the world. Go to your family, go to your friends, go to the people that need to know that Christianity is not a fan club. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a click. It's a lifestyle that was bought and purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead so that you could be set free like this woman, Mary of Magdala. So that you could be encouraged like these discouraged disciples who said, oh man, you know what? It's all done. So that we could be rebuked and corrected because of our lack of trusting the Lord like the disciples were here. And notice that none of these people said, oh, okay, 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 we believe now. No, Jesus empowered them to believe because they didn't have the power to believe. Like the man who came to Jesus with the sick child, and what did he say? I believe, but help my unbelief. You know how many Christians live in the middle of that phrase? I believe, but help my unbelief. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly... It will by no means hurt them. Listen, this is not to you to put God to the test. It's when those times do come and difficult situations happen, know that the Lord is with you. Too many Christians live their lives putting God to the test. We live so close to the world, so close to it, so close to it. How, how close can I live and still experience the grace of God? A true believer will never live that way. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. What is he doing now? He doesn't just leave them. Hebrews chapter 8, or excuse me, Romans chapter 8, verse 34, and Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, what does it say? He is interceding for us. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He didn't just tell the disciples, okay, now go, 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 go. You got the Holy Spirit, now go do it. Figure it all out. No. He says, listen, when, when difficulty comes, I'm going to be there. And I've given you a message. Don't worry about it. Don't, you don't have to know it all by heart, but just go and share it. The Spirit will reveal it to you. And what is he doing? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. We talked about this Sunday morning. He's interceding for you and me. Why? Because you have an accuser of the brethren that's up there accusing you day and night before the Lord. But Jesus is interceding for you. Why? So we can go and do what he's told us to do. Go ye therefore. And look at what happens here. And they went out. And preached everywhere, and the Lord working with them and confirming, listen to this, the word through the accompanying of signs. Amen. Guys, listen to this. Notice what it says here. It says in verse 17, and these signs will follow those who believe. Signs follow those who believe. Let me put it to you this way. You ready for this? Here's, here's, here's a good food for thought for you guys. It never says in the Bible that believers follow signs and wonders. Too many Christians chasing the next guru or prophet that's really there to make a profit off of you. He's not a prophet of the Lord. Oh, let's go to this concert. Let's go to this you know, healing crusade. Let's go to this. Why? Because you're chasing signs and wonders. The Bible says signs and wonders follow us that believe. You don't need to go chase nothing. You have all that you need in Christ. Amen? Amen? Take steps of faith. Trust him at his word. Keep your eyes on him. Live radically for Jesus because I'll tell you what, we're living in some times that if it's ever needed for us to live for him, it's now. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you.